Hello, my name is Samantha Marshall, Associate Director of Alumni Engagement for the University of Toledo Alumni Association. Welcome and thank you for joining us for a lively conversation with U Toledo alumnus Juan Montoya, where we will hear about his time at the University of Toledo and his many accolades since his time here at the university. I would like to share a few housekeeping notes for today's virtual experience. The following recording took place on April 8th, 2021, and will not only highlight Juan's career, but also give us an opportunity to hear how the University of Toledo impacted his life. Please join us for a live Q&A session following the release of this recording to meet fellow UT alumni and ask questions regarding the content you just viewed. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you today's moderator, Dr. Michael Boyd, Steinway artist and U Toledo professor of music. Welcome, Dr. Boyd. Thank you. Hello, I'd like to welcome all the UT alumni and friends who are watching this conversation with UT alumnus Juan Montoya. And Juan, thank you for joining us uh, from the other side of the globe this morning. Yes, hello everybody. I'm literally in the other side of the globe and it's a pleasure for me to be here with you and with everybody else. Yeah, it's, it's so good to see you again. Before we um, start uh, our questions and, and uh, about your what's been going on with you in your life, I thought maybe I'd just give a little bit of background and we'll fill in things as kind of we go along. So in, um, uh, Juan graduated from the University of Toledo from the Music Department um, at that time of the College of Arts and Sciences. This was in 2009. Um, he had a mass, he has a master's degree in both piano performance and orchestral conducting. So that kind of sets him apart from a lot of uh, other master's students, the fact that he was getting this double degree. Uh, apart from frequent international engagements, he's been the resident conductor of the Kuala Lumpur City Opera in Malaysia since 2014 and the director of orchestral studies at the university in Malaysia. So a uh, lot to kind of talk about, to see about, about your <laughs> life, but uh, it's always interesting to see how people get started and, and looking at your bio, one of the things I saw was some of your earliest musical studies were with your father and that doesn't happen a lot. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I think I am, um glad I am happy and I am lucky enough to have had that opportunity. My, my father is actually a, a popular musician, so he's not classically trained, but he is a musician. I mean, he dedicates his life to music. So I grew up with music all over the house all the time with musical instruments, with people playing, with people performing. So... I myself in my early days when I was very small used to play the piano and sing and do a lot of stuff. So music was always in my house. Uh, we can also say my mom is not a musician, but she's very in tune, we could say. <laughs> so that's, that's a good thing. So yeah, everything started from, from the family, from the family, we could say. How was that working with your, your father? Sometimes that can be, you know, within a family situation. Besides, you know, your, your studies, you've also got the personal relationships and things like that. I mean, did the two of you get along whenever you, whenever you were like working with some of your musical studies? <laughs> I think yes and no. I <laughs> think you, you, are, you are hitting an interesting point there because I, I think it happens always relationship between like, father and son like sometimes there are clashes sometimes there are conflicts and I actually one of the pieces I composed during my stay in the University of Toledo that was actually recorded by, by the National Symphony Orchestra it's called Baba which means father mm -hmm. I actually dedicated this piece to him kind of like like you know what I know we have been having so many misunderstandings along the way but here is my music, which is also his music. I mean, like we, we come from there, as I told you and all my professors, like we, we stand in the shoulders of all of you, no matter like what are we doing right now and how good we are doing. So that starts from your parents and then move to your teachers like you and others. And, and yeah, so we always have to be grateful and recognize that, that we are not here by ourselves. That's a, uh, an interesting aspect of um, uh, 
your studies. Now, I know how it was that you came. We were lucky enough to have you as a student at the University of Toledo, but why don't you tell everyone else kind of how you wound up in Toledo from Columbia? <laughs> yeah, the connection I think comes from another relationship you had with another colleague, Liz Frank. Yes. So probably later you tell us like how you guys were, how you knew each other. But she was my teacher and she's a North American teacher and she was living in Colombia. So she was my piano teacher there. And she's the one who encouraged me to go to Chautauqua Institute in 2003. That's, I will remember that year because I mean, that summer was one of the best summers in my life, I think. So first time going out of the country in this way of, of Colombia. And uh, I had the opportunity to study with uh, several teachers, actually Dr. Milbauer, John Milbauer, who was also there, who also became another mentor and colleague in the University of Arizona during my doctorate, so all those connections. And I had the luck that you were teaching there. We met there, we had lessons, we talked about the future. I, by then I, was, I didn't graduate yet from my bachelor, so. Of course, you said like, yeah, keep studying. And once you finished, uh, give me a call, let me know, <laughs> send me an email. So that's what I did. And thank you for accepting me because I think that was a good step for whatever is happening in my life. So I joined uh, UT in 2006. It's interesting how um, you know, our, our careers and people we know kind of intersect at a lot of different points and we'll talk about later on how you know you wound up making the transition to Malaysia but yes Lisa Frank I had uh, I was lucky enough to go to the North Carolina School of the Arts for high school she's one of my first uh -huh. friends there and we kept in contact and then she wound up being in Colombia and then she wound up teaching you and that's how this all happened and so it's, it's so really that's, nice. yeah. <laughs> that's how amazing it is you guys met from high school yeah. And then <laughs> everything connects. Yeah. Now, at, whenever you were at UT, you know, you and I, of course, worked on piano, but you had a lot of other faculty that you worked with. So can you tell us a little bit about your experiences in the music department? Yes. I, of course, had a piano lessons with you, which were amazing. I did two, two years with you. Right. And I think my other main professors there were uh, Dr. Jason Stumble and Rico Magnilla, Mr. Yes. Rico Magnilla. He was uh, conducting the orchestra back then. I don't think he is there anymore. But I think uh, we could say like the three of you in the performance side really shaped my, my career as a performer. Another person who really marked my career was uh, Dr. Heritage, Lee Heritage, because I have the luck to um, start uh, studying composition with him. And that was, I, I had like really, really good memories. I think with each one of you, I have a couple of things and things that I remember all the time because it's amazing from composition, from piano, from performance, from rehearsal techniques and all of this. So I have many, many memories. Maybe we can talk about it. I don't know if we yeah. have time. <laughs> no, go ahead, please do. Yeah, because going back to those times, I, I think uh, one thing that I, I was always uh, thankful with you is I don't know if you remember, uh, during my second year, I wanted to do the piano concerto competition, yep. but I had the crazy idea of writing my own piano concerto. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember like, if I come to this idea to another teacher, to another professor, they will be like, okay, I think this person is a little bit crazy. <laughs> and, but I, I will always remember that you were always like, go ahead, I mean, start writing it, show it to me. And, and you got so excited about it that you actually played the piano with me during the competition. If you remember, oh, yeah. you were my second, you were my second piano. So that was, for me, that was an amazing experience. Not only the support, not only the positive input from the very beginning, because again, like if you come with idea of, you know what, for this concerto competition this year, I want to write my own concerto. That's 
that's not common right and 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 you made it happen and you supported me and you gave me advice on the piano thing too not only on how to perform it but on the writing so that was very good i remember uh, with uh, mr rico magnilla the I learned a lot about orchestra. I learned a lot about strings because he's a string player. He was the conductor of the orchestra back then, but he's a violin player. So that was very good because I'm not a violin player and I didn't have idea of violin or, or yes, but like minimal. So when you have a teacher that is actually a really good violin player, so you really learn things and, and, and stuff that can help you during rehearsals. Uh, with Dr. Stombo, I remember that our lessons were really, really amazing because we read a lot of literature together. And he's a person who likes not only training you physically, but also mentally. So I remember he gave me a couple of books. One of those are uh, the Composer's Advocate. So everybody who is listening and wants to be a conductor, that should be a book that you should have in your library because that's an amazing book about conductors. And one thing I remember with him during rehearsals, he, he is the, the, as a conductor, he's the teacher who taught me how to manage time on rehearsals, because not many people knows how important that is in the professional world. Sometimes like it happens to me, I mean, now, of course, because of the pandemic, we cannot travel, but I've been in countries where I have where I have to do an opera in three rehearsals. That happened to me when I was in Europe uh, two or three years ago. And, and it, it is possible. So all those techniques you learn from there, I remember that Dr. Stombo used to rehearse. He gave me the symphonic band. He was with a stopwatch. Okay, whatever you have to say, I give you seven seconds. And I was like, and then, <laughs> uh, he, used to, he used to do the noise like uh, too much because I used to talk too much. Like I'm talking right now, but <laughs> in front of in front of the people and that's not good you know when people go to a rehearsal they don't want to hear the conductor blah blah blah, blah, blah. they just want to hear stop this this, this. let's keep going this, this this let's keep going so i think from that side that was one thing that i'm still applying right now and now it became automatic but for a while it was like a stopwatch in my head like i always remember him <laughs> and i think from dr heritage uh, the composition side because he's a very patient person he's a very his knowledge is very vast and and i remember i i had a, a nice anecdote with him when i was composing this piece remember we talked at the beginning this baba piece that i dedicated to my dad to this piece is kind of dedicated not only to my dad but to these father figures because i think we always have conflicts with the fathers like with the mothers we are always like closer and like more huggable and the love is easier to show and to and to receive with fathers the the situation is a little bit different and we share music so even sharing music like the situation was a little bit difficult and i remember i was working on this piece and i i wrote the section a to put it in some way this piece is like ABA. And then I remember I wrote section B and I won't forget that when I wrote section B, Dr. Heritage, he literally told me like, this is, this is not you. This is, this is not you and this is not this piece. Like the best thing you can do is throw that page, <laughs> try it again. And, and that's one of those moments that, that's one of those lessons that you understand that sometimes restarting is good because I could have said like, oh no, let me fix it. Oh no, let me edit it. But he was like, this is not you and this doesn't belong to this page. Just throw this page, try it again in section B. I did and then the Peace Warrior was very successful. And as I mentioned, it got selected to be recorded by the National Symphony of Colombia. Yeah. So beautiful, beautiful. So all of these experiences, I think, are the ones that build you that I was telling you that you stand on the shoulders of all of you. <laughs> and I'm sure I have more, but I mean, these are the ones that are, these are my highlights. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I think that, that that's great because you have had so many um, different skills, 
sets. I mean, the, you learn different things from conducting. You learn different things from learning how to perform on the piano, and you learn different things from compositions. And that, and that has kind of, I think, helped formulate who you are now. And I think it plays hey. a lot into you, all, you know, all the success that you've had. Now, on, on a more general note, now, do you have any fond memories of just Toledo in, in general whenever you were here? <laughs> <laughs> Toledo is... Yeah, Toledo, I think is one of those places that have a special place in my heart. I haven't been there in, in a long time. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, probably since I left, probably since I left. So I remember that I kind of witnessed a little bit of the transformation of Toledo because when I arrived in Toledo, it was right in the deepest side of the economic crisis. Yeah. And, and I still remember that, that it was kind of like a gloomy place. And towards the end, when I was leaving, the place was building up again. So that one, that was one thing, talking as a city, yeah. not as a university, but as a city, that was a nice thing to see how the city got together and the economy got better and things started to get recovering slowly. And, and yeah, I think also seasons because i mean colombia doesn't have season as you know malaysia is in this, exactly the same equator line as oh, colombia oh, really? okay. so so we don't have seasons here so when i was living in ohio that was the only time in my life where i experienced seasons like the the whole way you know like i went for vacations and i saw snow and yeah yeah <laughs> no it's more like you live the whole four seasons for three years, because I also lived in Arizona later, probably right. later, we are going to talk about that, but I mean, Arizona, you know, that's just right. desert, that's it. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so since you're from Colombia, I came to the University of Toledo, so how did you wind up getting to Malaysia? Oh yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I was interested in, on coming to Asia. Yeah. and coming to teach in Asia. I actually applied to several places and the university here where I'm still working right now is called UITM University in Malaysia. It's one of the biggest universities here in Malaysia. And it's a place that I could call like a second home because I worked in UITM from 2010, 2015, right after Toledo. Then I left for five years for my doctorate and for performances. And now I'm back here again. So, so we could say that UITM University here is kind of like a second home. Uh, I was lucky enough that they, when I was looking to for a place in Asia, I applied to several places. I have some, uh, I knew some people who was working in the university in another department. They helped me connect with the faculty of music. At the faculty of music got interested on in my CV on my career and then I started working there in 2010. Yeah. It, it's always interesting to see kind of from from where we start where we wind up you know yeah <laughs> where, where, where they take us I mean I've always felt very lucky um, you know to have been uh, at the University of Toledo. So uh, speaking of Columbia uh, you have a very special award from the government there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that was very nice. That was in 2019. I got a, a how do you call that in English? Let me try to translate it. It's <laughs> like a, it's like an order of merit, like a medal of, we cannot, medal of honor, no, that sounds too like military-like, like a medal of merit or something like that. Yeah. It's a, it's an, an award from the city council. It's like, for example, if Toledo gives me an award, so the city where I'm from is Medellin in Colombia. So it's an award from the city council of Medellin, which recognizes uh, careers from different people, not only artists, you could be a painter, you could be a politician, you could be a writer, just, person, just people who have been doing like, good things for society so that was a big honor for me uh, i got it in the silver category and it may be later if somebody's interested you can check my website and my speech acceptance is there oh, right. yeah. 
So, so it was a very nice award and they just give a few of those every year. So mm -hmm. I was lucky enough for 2019, August, 2019. Yeah, yeah. That's always nice to be kind of recognized from, you know, where, where you grew up and, and, and where you're from. But uh, with speaking of like where you are currently, you also have like some recognition, like in Malaysia, you got the best music director in 2019, an award there. Yeah, in 2019, because uh, we could say Malaysia has some art awards that are very prestigious here. So these art awards are for performing arts, theater, dance, music, uh, yeah, mostly that, like theater art music. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was, no, we were nominated because this was with the Kuala Lumpur City Opera. Yeah. So we were nominated for our opera, uh, Madama Butterfly. Great. So we actually got a couple of nominations, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think we got leading role, which was our Butterfly, mm. uh, Cecilia Yap, amazing soprano. Mm. We also got, I think, lighting design, sound design, and a best music director nomination with mm. other productions and other things in Malaysia. And if I'm not mistaken, we managed to get two of those prizes, music director and another one, which I'm not remembering clearly right now. So that was a big success because that recognized the, the career we are trying to build with the Kuala Lumpur City Opera. It's a very young company. They started two years before I joined them. I joined them in 2014. Mm -hmm. They started at, uh, in 2012. And I've been the director there uh, since 2014. So nonstop, even when I left for those five years, Malaysia, I kept coming back here like three, four months of the year I was here in Malaysia conducting. Okay. So, so yeah, that was a good award for us as a company, not only for me individually, but for us, because that recognizes the, the work we are doing. We are the only opera company in Malaysia, in the country. And we always try to use and encourage local musicians mm -hmm. and Malaysian singers. Mm -hmm. so, so that's also good because it's all local talent. So that's amazing. Yes, that, that's a very nice piece of recognition, I think, for, for, for you. And also just a, it speaks about the work that you're doing there. Now, uh, one thing that you know, is, has affected musicians and worldwide, you know, in, in every country, of course, is the um, pandemic. And it's been a you know, very difficult time for performing organizations, for music, musicians. Can you talk a little bit about what has been going on in Malaysia and how it's affected what, your work there? Yeah, I think, as you said, this is a complete global situation, yeah. nobody escaped from it. I mean, unless you are in New Zealand, but apart from that, I think every, every single country in the planet is having a hard time. Uh, we could say Malaysia is doing pretty well since the very beginning. They had really tough measures from the beginning, March, 2020. They had really, really tough measures, but I think they really worked. Because right now we, we, we just have two waves, we could say. Hopefully we don't get into another wave. But so far the numbers are controlled. This is a country that relies a lot on technology. So everybody uses the cell phones to check in everywhere you go. So I think that's amazing the work they are doing here. Because if somebody gets infected somewhere, everybody who was around that person at that exact time, we get notifications and go check. And the government is managing that. Uh, masks are mandatory, so that also helps. I mean, you have to wear it, no choice. So, I mean, or you have a choice, you have to pay like, I don't know, 5,000 US dollars if you are not wearing a mask. Oh, wow. So, so and, and I think it, it, it's good, it works. Like, if you see our numbers compared to other countries, mm -hmm. I mean, I think talking about Malaysia, right. I don't know, we are like, 50 something in the list or something which is right. yeah. pretty good in this situation and uh, regarding the arts the arts are struggling a bit the government is helping a little bit but it, it's a struggle that everybody in the world is, is experiencing what happened with the opera company is that we 
planned 2020. Of course, 2020 couldn't happen. And we started delaying, 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 delaying until it came to a point that we were like, you know what? I, we, I don't think 2020 is going to happen. <laughs> so, so we kind of like moved 2020 to, 20, uh, to 2021. Uh, 2021 is a little bit better. I'm going to have, for example, I'm going to have an activity next week, Tuesday the 13th. But I mean, this is a recorded program, so right. don't don't get confused, people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so next week from this recording, uh, I'm going to we are going to perform La Voix Humaine uh, Poulang, mm -hmm. uh, first week, uh, yeah, eight and 9th of May. So you see slowly things are building up. The government is allowing people and the theaters just 50%, which we have to take and we have to use it. And I think people are really eager to go back to music, go back to theaters. Cinemas are open again since a few weeks ago. So slowly the arts are recovering. Again, this is a very weird virus because it goes in the air. So it could get bad again. I think the only solution is like a vaccine for everybody. So we are in the process of that here too. I think the US is going really well with the vaccination. I mean, the speed there is amazing. So that's great. Here is happening in a slower rate. So, so yeah, so far what we are trying to do, for example, at the opera, the Kuala Lumpur City Opera is just planning for the best because I think that's what you should do. Not thinking like, oh, this is so sad, or oh, this is not working. No, I'm going to give up. No, like plan for the best, but know that may not happen. Right. So we plan for the best uh, with the producers of the opera, uh, Danny and Sun Yun. They both are like great people. And we all, we all three are like positive people. So we are like, okay, let's do it. Yeah. And then the, maybe the government, like what happened in 2020, the government said like, sorry, no. So we're like, okay, no, but let's plan this. Sorry, no, sorry, no. And then when things can happen, we make it happen. Yeah. With the university, we are still teaching at UITM University, we are teaching virtually. I think most of the universities around the world are doing it that way. So that's a little bit easier. It's not ideal because I honestly like teaching face-to-face, -face, but, but for now, I think that that should be enough for now, like just to keep us all safe while we all get better. Right. I, I think it's, um, we've uh, all become very creative with, with this. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and how to, you know, keep ourselves going, to keep our students going, to you know, figure out what to do with audience engagement, too, so as we don't lose, you know, audience. Exactly, yeah. There.
Now, you've done a couple of international uh, conducting competitions. Can you talk a little about what that was like? Did you, do you enjoy doing competitions? I guess that's the, the, the first thing. Yeah, I honestly it. like doing comp I honestly like doing competitions because you learn a lot of repertoire. I had a personal advantage that I mean it's not like I want to show off, but I don't get nervous. So I think that's an advantage I have Big when I'm perfect. <laughs> but <laughs> when I'm <laughs> when I'm conducting, I mean it, the hall could be full of people or in competitions, you I can have six judges like sitting right beside me and I, I just don't care. I have like, let's do this, da, 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 and then I do it, and it, it is good. Of course, I have attended many competitions, which, which is a thing I recommend if we have some uh, future conductors here. Competitions are very good. Of course, we have to wait for the world right. to get better because most of the nice or cool or relevant competitions are in Europe. Uh, I think one of the most successful ones I had was in Bulgaria, uh, one of the most important opera conducting competitions uh, in the world. So I got third place on that one. I was very, very happy with that because it was, I'm not sure how many people applied for it, I guess hundreds. They selected 52 of us to go to Rus, Bulgaria, uh, uh, at the Rus Opera House to compete there. It was four rounds and I got to the finals and then I managed to get third place. And the good news is like, I got the third place and all the, ju the jury prices. So, mm. so that was good because yeah. the jury prices were, were concerts. So that's yeah. <laughs> why I went to, that's why I went, for example, to, to the Cairo opera in Egypt. That was pretty good to go there. That was pretty nice to go there in other places. So I think that was a nice competition and, and yeah, very nice experience. I recommend everybody to do it because it's, it's nice. Yeah. That's, um, that's nice. I mean, with the, the, um, the engagement that's kind of given you from the competitions of going to like, you know, different countries, like been Hungary, Hungary, Romania, different things. Do you, is, do you find that tough to kind of go into an orchestra like that you've never worked with before and usually you have like you know a limited amount of time to put things together i think it is challenging if you don't know how to do it you really need to save time and as i told you earlier with my anecdote like i learned since my masters at beauty that time is important for example one of my, uh, I was at the Hungarian Opera at Cluj and one of the be, the most challenging experiences I had to do Madama Butterfly in three rehearsals. Now we are talking with opera, with these people are amazing. I mean, it's a big opera house. They literally do an opera every week. Yeah. So you have to understand that it's not like students, you don't have to rehearse them from every note. They have yeah. probably played this piece I don't know, each one of them five, six times, perhaps more. So you just have to go there with your ideas and not try to teach them something that they already know. More like, you know, I, I, I'm bringing these ideas. I hope you guys like it. I'm bringing these tempos. I hope you, like, you guys like it and so on, let's do it. One interesting thing I found is, for example, in Bulgaria, when I was conducting in Bulgaria, uh, English was very poor there. So that was a little bit challenging because I actually had to have a table. I had my score and another stand here with all the numbers in Bulgarian. Uh, because one, one thing that, that I learned from traveling around is that you actually don't need to speak too much. But one thing that you need to know is the numbers. Because during rehearsals, yeah. because during rehearsals if you say, let's go for 55, but if you say 55 and nobody knows what's 55, then that's an issue. So that's one thing I, I learned traveling, that if I go to a country where I know English is not the main language or something, or, or if the, the thing is like, I wrote that and actually it worked. Like I had all the numbers and actually I knew what numbers, what rehearsal numbers could be an issue. So I will be like, for example, Marawa Butterfly 55. I'm just giving an example. So I wrote 
on top of 55, how to say 55 in Bulgarian. And that's very easy. You just go on Google and push Google and Google will tell you how to say <laughs> right. it. And it worked. So yeah. all of these little things save time. You you may think that, okay, that's not too much. That's actually a lot because you can spend five minutes just transmitting number 55 to the whole orchestra. Right. So, so rehearsal numbers are important. Apart from that, uh, Italian is the language of the of the music. A lot of people in around the world and in Europe they speak Italian almost fluently. I had the chance to learn Italian too. I live in Italy a little bit. I actually went to Italy just to learn Italian. Nice. So that's an that's another tool I have under my sleeve. We could say that if I get yeah. in trouble, I can turn into Italian. And when you're do when you're doing opera. I, I could say that like 90% of the singers, they you can communicate with them in Italian. So so that's also good, yeah. Yeah, that, that's um, very smart in there because I mean, just from knowing a lot of orchestral players, I mean, they really appreciate whenever conductor values like the time in there and knows how to use it efficiently. I mean, they that, that is the quickest way to get the respect of like, of the orchestra in there. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think it works like that, yeah, yeah. Um, so to kind of maybe uh, finish up a little bit earlier, you had said that you recommended competitions for like people who are just kind of coming up and, and, and to kind of like further their careers. What advice would you have for like young musicians in the in the current world, let's say past pandemic when we're weak, things get back to normal? What, what advice would you have? And there is there are many many things I could say, but I think first of all we are not living in normal times. I don't right. think anybody who is alive right now have experienced a pandemic of this size. So we have to start from a point that we are living in unprecedented times, and do do not get too scared because people need music. Even if right now doesn't music doesn't feel like the priority a government wise economic wise or whichever way you think my advice is do not give up because because when you give up you are just giving a space to the people who are not going to give up and music music is something that you keep pushing you keep pushing you you are going to feel down many times in your life even it could be because of yourself or it could be because of situations like right now we are talking about the competition as I have won, but mm. I've been to many competitions that I haven't won. So, and what are, what are those? Those are good experiences. You learn some things, you, you sometimes you don't understand what happened and that's okay too, that's life. So my advice is uh, uh, music is a little bit challenging, not only in the technique, not only in how you create music, but how you treat yourself and how you think. And if you have a goal, keep following it because that, that's the only way you are going to reach the goal. I mean, some people say like, no, I, I don't know if I'm going to reach that goal, but, and then they give up, but what if you reach it? I mean, what, what, what if that thing that you drink happens? And the only way that you are going to answer that question is if, you keep going. It doesn't matter if you go slow. Don't don't let social media or other things think that you have to do everything right now or before you are some age. Sometimes slow and steady is better. So that, that would be my, my main advice. Don't give up because we all, or at least myself, I have had many occasions where I'm like, eh. but they are very sure because inside of me, there is also that person that, nope, let's keep going. That's where we are going, and and I think I I, I, I mean I'm still walking that way, and, mm, but yeah. I think during that path, successes happen. You make friends, your career get recognized, and and things things get better. I think so. Yeah, I think that's yeah, you know, really excellent advice for plates into so many different areas. Well, listen, one, it's been great catching up and seeing you like uh, 
via Zoom, hopefully, like we can yeah, digitally person <laughs> someday. Like, a, yeah, come back to Toledo to kind of like re you know, reconnect and see what's changed in the in oh yeah Toledo and at the, at the university. I'm I'm sure there are many more new exciting things, and yeah, who knows? Maybe we can work out something musical for me there, and I could visit you whenever this whole pandemic happens, like ends, exactly. and that would... we are free again. <laughs> no, that would be terrific. Really, thanks for taking all the time and to tell us about what's been going on with you. Thank you for the invitation. It's so great to see you again. Sure, you too. Juan, on behalf of the University of Toledo Alumni Association, I also want to thank you for joining us. We are so proud of you and all of your accomplishments. And as Dr. Boyd mentioned, if you're ever back in the States, look us up, come see us in Toledo. We'd be yeah, yeah. happy to <laughs> spend some time um, and you know, meeting you in person. I have not had the pleasure of uh, meeting you in person and, and I hope one day we, we have that opportunity. I also want to thank everyone um, who is watching this on demand. As we mentioned, this is a recording from April 8th, uh, but please hang tight. We do have some short clips from various performances that we are going to share with you. Um, so those will be um, added into the recording here shortly. And, and Juan, thanks again uh, for chatting with us today, or I should say this evening <laughs> for you. This evening, yeah. <laughs> this evening. <laughs> thanks for staying up uh, to have this conversation. It, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure was mine. Thank you. Thank you.